Well, hello, everyone. We expect approximately 77 uh, people who have registered for this webinar, which is very exciting. I'd like to welcome you to our very first ASL webinar session of this year. And I'm very excited and looking forward, oh, first of all, to recording this webinar. We will then edit it and it will become available online on our website for everyone to be able to watch whenever you'd like. Now, this ASL lecture series, we at DLI recognize that practitioners always need ongoing professional development or PD on a wide variety of topics having to do with teaching. So at DLI, we have been searching for different people to present to us. And I first met Dr. Michael Skyer through one of his Gallaudet University Zooms. We were a part of that. And when I saw Dr. Skyer's presentation, I was immediately in touch with him and invited him to be a speaker for us. So we're very honored to have him here with us. And just a little bit about Michael's background. He began studying in the field of deaf education in 2012, and his journey led him to become a lecturer, as well as a teacher in a graduate deaf and hard of hearing education program, master's program in deaf education. And he recently became an associate professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. That's right. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you. I happened to see one of his online presentations about deaf education where he went quite in depth, but it has a lot of application to our stream and literacy. I'm very excited to welcome him uh, and I'm honored to have him here. I will now turn the floor over to you, Michael Skyer. Let me spotlight you. Thank you. I'll just, uh, I'll wait until that's taken care of. Hello, hello everyone. First, I just want to thank you, Jeff, so much for inviting me here. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to share a little bit of my research uh, that I've gotten into. Uh, I'm very, uh, I feel very humbled. I want to apologize briefly as well for the delay of the starting of this workshop. Uh, Jeff has mentioned recently that uh, I'm recently joined the uh, new university, and I currently have. Uh, three Zoom accounts. <laughs> and so Jeff sent me an invitation to one of the accounts. And uh, I checked my first account. It wasn't there. The second account wasn't there. Finally, when I tried to join using my third account, I was successful. So I guess uh, I was hoping that we could get uh, started soon. I'm going to share you uh, my screen with some of the information uh, that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Jeff, uh, would you mind um, giving me co-host abilities so that I can share my materials on screen? Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, to let you know, my presentation is probably going to be in AS is, is actually going to be in ASL. But if you do have questions, we can use um, we can use the chat. And after my presentation is completed. I'll be able to answer some questions. There'll be a QA about 10 minutes at the end of the session. So about 50 minutes was what I'll be presenting my material. And then I'll turn it over to you 
to participate in some uh, interactive activities. This is a workshop, so it's about how to apply some of the ideas I'm going to be showing you today. And then once we get back together, I'll, I'll have like a plenary at the end to discuss future plans and what we're going to be doing next. You should be able to see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up that everybody can see the presentation slides that I have up? Just checking to make sure that um, sometimes we have a, it should be a slide that says curriculum and power in deaf education. Also, I also wanted to share with you that my slides uh, will have handouts as well, and I will be sending that. It will be a Google Drive document that I'll be sharing. Right now, I'll post the link into the chat. That way, if you wanted to download it and uh, put it on a separate device or follow along, that's fine. And it's totally yours. You can save it and, and copy it as, as you like. Well, let me just copy and paste that now. Shoot, it says I'm not able to upload the slides right now. Darn it. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides at the moment and then I think I'll just go ahead with my presentation. So my lecture today is gonna to be in four parts. I'll start off by introducing myself and explain a little bit more of who I am, where my journey began, what maybe I think about a few things that I've done in my career, and then give you a bit of examples around that. I'm going to examine uh, three different areas. We'll start on a macro level, and we'll and we'll look uh, at, as we move through the presentation at a more in depth. I'm going to look at analysis about what curriculum studies are and how it affects what is deaf curriculum as well and how it relates. I'll come up with some ideas on how to incorporate into, I'm oh, sorry, the interpreter's just struggling, Carol. I will be putting you into some groups for applications part number three. Uh, then we'll come back together and conclude. I will begin with my introduction. Thank you. So I'll just give you a bit of brief who I am. Here, I'll let you read the slide at the moment. Okay. Today I'm representing the University of Tennessee. I'm located in Knoxville and I'm an assistant professor here. However, um, yeah, it's, when I started, I started as a baby, of course, in my journey. <laughs> so I'll tell you my story. I uh, started off in Rochester, New York. Uh, my parents are both deaf. My mother was born deaf and my father was uh, late deafened. Both my parents are highly educated. Um, so it was a, uh, and also bilingual. Myself, I, um, I have multiple disabilities, including deafness. I was mainstreamed through the education system um, for many years until I graduated high school. And what was really strange about that experience is that despite my parents being deaf, having sign language as first language in home, there wasn't any supports provided during my education. No interpreters, no note takers. I, I didn't realize that how strange that was at the time until later on in life. Then I attended college and I found, um, I was working as a note taker in the universe, in the colleges. for other deaf students. At that time, I remember seeing an interpreter in the classroom and I, and I was like shocked 
I was trying to take notes for the for the other pupils, and I was fascinated by this person at the front of the room that was providing all of this information that I had missed out on. And I realized that without that, I was missing a, a large portion of the content from the courses that was there. So it was became a bit of a mind shift for me. Um, I had some other experiences as tutors. I tutored, uh, I worked in the tutoring services department, Texas Bay Department, and uh, working with uh, courses, various courses. I worked um, with students in, in, in the art and in English uh, and mostly with deaf people. But I noticed that, uh, excuse me, sorry. Karen. There wasn't a lot of jobs uh, and a lot of training was required from deaf residential schools in the US is where I began teaching in the Midwest, the United States. And it was a eye-opening experience for me. It was quite a shock for me. My assistant teacher had said, Michael, you have to drop uh, that way of thinking in English. You have to stop that. And I had never even realized I was doing that. It required a complete mind shift in pedagogy, starting to think in ASL. And so I had other experiences that really real that made me realize uh, about disability in general. Then I had some training. Now in my classroom, I had young students, three of them were age four and very bright. They were disabled uh, and had autism. Some of them had other physical disabilities. Some of them were deaf or low vision and that comprised my classroom. That was 50%. The other 50% of my class were students with no other disabilities. And all of those students interacted with each other on a daily basis. I learned a lot about potential from that. Then I began, uh, I joined the high school faculty for a year. It was another eye-opening experience for me because it was, uh, I was co-teaching this curriculum it had to do with arts and science in the high school. I saw how science and English were linked together um, and working with elementary students as well as high school students. And so we were working on science literacy. It was incredible. And then I went on to teaching in higher education in college. I was working on literacy, uh, composition, and rhetoric in college settings. And then I went on to be faculty at a deaf education training program. And while I was teaching in college, I was uh, getting my PhD. As Jeff mentioned, I started in 2012. And that was my journey. I like to call that an odyssey for me. It was a lot of magical and amazing eye-opening things that happened to me. As uh, everyone has experienced, the, the COVID pandemic had a huge impact on education and things changed once again we realized the potential for deaf education. And then two months ago or so is when I began teaching at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. <clears throat> and you'll have to forgive me because another big change happened for me that I like to share is that my son was born. And he is such a beautiful young child. I'm so in love with him. However, it has messed up my sleep schedule. 
So last night I was awake at five in the morning. Uh, and basically I've been working since 5 a.m. until one. Uh, and it's like doing my PhD all over again, working all the time with no or little sleep. But uh, that's just a little bit of a bio of who I am. At the top of the slide, it says curriculum vitae. And I chose those words quite carefully. And I'll tell you a little bit more about me as we go on. I'd like to start off by talking about what curriculum is. And I'm going to sign this sign in ASL for curriculum. What I'm going to do now is show you um, a comparison between similar and different um, philosophies. How about you? I'd like you to read through these um, before I go into them. The person on the left, um, I'm going to be referring to Dewey, he's a very famous American philosopher. Who has been involved in the education. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the fingers. Oh. Democracy. He has uh, had a lot of experience showing different worlds and bodies of knowledge through his research. I can't hear you, Carolyn. Interpreter just missed that. What that means is We had a large body of science and knowledge, and then eventually pieces began to break off and represent different things in different areas. The interpreter missed that spelling with the freezing, uh, history of biology, anthropology, and other research paleontology, geography, all sorts of different series and, and parts of science. And that is called a body of knowledge. And that is what Dewey represented. But then more recently, 100 plus years after Dewey was Muwissen. Muwissen stated that curriculum is everything that a student encounters in education. And so that could include materials, lectures, different graphics or images, apps, and digital tools, things such as our smartphones, laptops, even scissors. <laughs> They're physical tools. And that is everything that a student can touch, see, smell, hear, and interact with. So this is a very broad definition. And a couple of others that I'd like to look at. On the left-hand side, I'll let you read. 
Bob it was one of the first uh, people to study. And he said that curriculum is, are all experiences, be them planned or unplanned, that construct abilities in an individual. Now, it's stated very interestingly. So it says planned or unplanned. And they're constructed abilities in an individual. What that means is we build through learning from the curriculum. We build upon each other. And wow, that's an amazing definition. And then more recently, again, is from the Indiana Department of Education. That's a state in the US. In 2010, they said that curricula are planned interactions between pupils, students, content, materials, and processes. So if you contrast these two definitions, there are some major differences. Bob mentioned planned or spontaneous slash unplanned experiences that happen within the school curriculum. And even if the teacher tells a story on something unrelated, it still has to do with a student's learning. But the in Indiana, they say it has to be planned interactions with the students. Now, there are differences between the American and Canadian education systems, for sure. One important difference that happened in the United States in 1999 was school shootings, mass school shootings happening. And the numbers have increased since 1999. All of these atrocities that have taken place and the consequences or outcomes of uh, these mass shootings, that has become part of the curriculum in an informal way and an unplanned way, but it's traumatizing. And that has resulted in ways students learn as well. And so because of that, schools have taken on practice drills in lockdowns when a shooter um, is happening. Okay. Have a look at the slide. I'm gonna demonstrate how everything is connected and these three words are connected. Curriculum, pedagogy. The third word is assessment. And they all are based on metaphors. The first one, pedagogy, that means the way of instructing or how to teach somebody. Die, oh, I missed the finger spelling directed learning or instructing. The metaphor to that is that um, it comes from a word as if curriculum means walking beside on a path. So it would be in this stance, a um, teacher and a student walking along beside each other along a pathway. This is pedagogy. Um, peda is, comes from the root word of foot. This is why uh, we talk about walking a path. Pedagogy and assessment. Now we'll talk about assessment where there's a, a, an official way of looking at, measuring, collecting data on the movements, testing. And the metaphor is interesting on, on assessment as well. Assessment comes from the root of sitting next to or, or 
having somebody, uh, having an instructor assess somebody while they're sitting there. Uh, I missed the word. Um, like an apprentice or apprenticeship role where the instructor sits next to the student and encourages them to gain more knowledge. And the metaphor to that is sitting beside or, or sitting next to. The for, third word, curriculum, is essentially called the path. It comes from the root word, the path. So all of these terms link together, walking along a path, along the path, and sometimes sitting down, sitting next to. It's a very interesting um, visual word, uh, connection. It all relates to how a learning, how learning happens and the experiences of the learner. I'm going to go into a little bit more depth and explain more in the next few slides and throughout the rest of this lecture. Have a look at this slide, please. Sometimes talking about the philosophy and how curriculum and curriculum studies, how they link together. I'd like to talk about four, four. The first one is a, a unit of ontology, which is a systems of being. It's a body, essentially. Uh, it's a body of truth. The next word is epistemology. This is the sign I use which is the systems of, uh, or the way of knowing. This is how information is exchanged or knowledge is exchanged. It is regulated by the third word, uh, by axiology. This is essentially the way of we, how we value. Systems of value, excuse me, thank you. These curriculum studies adds the methodology or the systems of researching and can build on uh, knowledge and building knowledge together. Curriculum itself holistically includes all four of these terms. One picture I think might help you understand in a visual way is this, is this image. Have a look at it. Interpreter was just asking the presenter to spell slower because of the quality. I'm going to zoom in and show you the different terms that I was just referring to. Axiology being the center of this image. Ontology. And epistemology. Uh, this is my sign for, then this is methodology and they all work together this way. All four of these concepts, I'm going to be talking about how they relate to deaf education. This image I borrowed from one of my uh, recent graduates, published uh, recent, one of my publications, excuse me. I'm gonna go into uh, a little bit more in depth now. This is a simple question I'd like to pose. So what? So what? What is the value? What is the value for study, curriculum studies? Research of curriculum helps us to really critically ana analyze or have a critical analysis of content, of education, of the processes, of materials, and making sure that they all uh, coordinate together 
into knowledge, integrate knowledge and experience. It also helps with understanding who, who's included, who uh, can be included, what knowledge is already established and valued. This also talks about who's been left out, who has been kept out of this sphere of knowledge exchange, which which knowledge or which people were left out of this? That's what critical analysis of curriculum studies can achieve. I'm gonna do a little bit more about what curriculum studies are and what is deaf curriculum and how what the context is might help uh, the audience here understand and connect it to the deaf education environment. So now I'd like to take this concept and dive real deep into what is curriculum for the deaf or deaf curriculum? Now, everybody's thinking about it. Um, everybody has ideas about it. But I'd like to build, well, it is essentially building on knowledge. And I'd like to clarify that a little bit. And I think you can, as practitioners, look back on how this has worked for you and how you have implemented it in your practice. I'd like to start at the top of this slide um, where there's a number of problems and in the bottom of the slide talks about potential solutions. Problem number one, I think, is that the deaf studies of curriculum or research of in curriculum, deaf curriculum, lags so far behind compared to other fields. It is so far behind in terms of the amount of research. In 1996, um, this person spoke about that. There was, and we thought since 1996, how much change could there be? And unfortunately, it's a, it still has not changed. There's been very, very little improvement or it changes to research into deaf, deaf curriculum. The most recent um, evidence I quote from Patty Ladd, uh, who is a researcher, a deaf researcher in, deaf, uh, in, in education, excuse me, a researcher in deaf education. It's a recent publication, 2022, this year, and I, I just got it in the mail, I think, yesterday, <laughs> uh, and I'm really excited about that. I can show you what it looks like for your, for your knowledge. Here we are. As you can see, it's quite substantial. <laughs> this book really focuses and dives right into um, uh, K-12 education and deaf education and curriculum in that environment. The, um, it talks about what instructors value, what's it put into practice, what is done. It's a, it's a fascinating book I'm excited to read. It's the first big work, uh, research on deaf curriculum in ever, actually, I would say. Now I'd like to talk about some of the suggestions or solutions and ideas. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Patty Ladd's book focuses on the K-12 environment, but I think there is a, uh, Patty Ladd is a deaf educator as well, as well as being deaf. As a deaf person who's gone into a classroom and uh, um, has had experience with that, it's quite a powerful piece of research. This is an example of mine uh, that I showed, that I referred to is a direct, sorry, the interpreter missed that direct. My dissertation was published last year in the Pedagogy of Deaf uh, Education. 
Um, the, the next part should be focused on a college level or higher education research of deaf curriculum as well. I think collecting all of the data from my, in my dissertation, I looked at a lot of different aspects of the curriculum, how it's overall, how deaf people and deaf students and deaf teachers provide education in curriculum environments. Here's mine. <laughs> also, uh, quite substantial. <laughs> Let's compare. <laughs> so here are two pieces of research, and that's it. But again, I just want to focus on the fact that there is a enormous, enormous scale between the years of kindergarten through to grade 12. There's an enormous um, field to be uh, researched and studied. As an even higher level, like graduate level education. Caroline, can't hear you, you're on mute. Rigorous curriculum studies and deaf education are needed. And then this text that I'm showing you discusses curriculum. It says that curriculum for deaf and hard of hearing must be constructed for deaf students beginning from the ground up that curriculum should not be taken and adapted for deaf students. It should be built with them. It's radical. So what does this research show? I was speaking about ideas of methodologies, and there are two concepts in methodologies. One of them is called transferability. The second one is called generalization. Both of them are quite valuable. So transferability from what? And that is a qualitative approach of research. Information is gathered from one area, uh, or it could be another uh, region. <clears throat> and then when you look at generalization in terms of research, that's quantitative research. And they both have the same goals, to begin small and to be able to generalize it, apply it across larger bodies. Uh, there are differences. I'm going to refer to them as T and G. There are similarities and differences that help build on the research. Here are three different examples of research in both transferability and generalization. The majority of learning is focused, excuse me, deaf research is focused on learning, psychology, and language modality. 
could be sign language, it can be spoken language, even written language. And then these three researchers are quite well known. One is Marshark and Hauser, who wrote how deaf, sorry, the interpreter's not sure of a sign. Excuse me, how deaf children learn. Thank you for that clarification. And then my favorite text is right here. It's the collected works of Vygotsky. This is his sign name. And as you can see here, education for deaf children is in this book. Now he has written quite a bit about deaf education, learning and psychology of growing up. Another text written by Glickman and Hall. And this focuses on language deprivation. It's very interesting. Vygotsky's text uh, only spoke about it twice. It's a 400 page text and there's two sentences on curriculum, that's all. And then you have this language deprivation and deaf mental health. It does not mention deaf curriculum at all. Clearly there are some differences and uh, you can see how development of curriculum proceeds here. Now the next one states that a minority of transferability and generalization deaf research investigates pedagogic methods linked with multimodality. That is how we exchange information using many different modalities, colors, lines, shapes, images, words, signs, all of these are considered multimodality. And so the T and G research is vast and growing and it is critical. We need to have further pedagogic research, but there's not very much available in curriculum studies. There just isn't. And then the third point here is scant research exists in a curriculum content with interactions. So we have one uh, publication from Meath and Lang right here, discussing bilingualism with deaf children, uh, which is a very good text. There's some that we know, there's uh, some growing bodies, but we're not that well-versed. So what do we know? Again, a few to, excuse me, a few things to show you. And we'll show the similarities and contrasts, pardon me. Skyer wrote that deaf-centric curricula and pedagogies are situa situated in the dialects of disability and ability on a continuum between of hearing loss and deaf gain.
So dialectics. There are definitely benef benefits and limitations. The result is that deaf children learn differently. That's a fact. All of these publications say that. Deaf children have different needs. And then when you look at Ladd in 2022, he said that deaf pedagogies and deaf curricula historically and currently are marginalized. And that future work may help in the reconstruction of deaf education. So a huge point from Vygotsky's works said that we have to build a, a deaf education from the ground up. Without that foundation, you don't have any stability. And so things are changing and developing and beginning to develop new ways. Here is a working definition of deaf curriculum. You can read it. You can see how the design is to have all of this come together, to use all of our sensibilities. And instead of trying to make something that is already in place fit and adapt it for deaf children, it is built from and by the deaf upwards using multi-modalities and different tools. For example, we have chat in Zoom while this presentation is going on. Ideas are able to be shared with each other and it's very important, it's worth it. My presentation being given in ASL is one modality as well as using my visual aids, my slides. And that is contrasting colors that I have on my slides so that it's very accessible for people who have low vision. My third point here is using cognitive and metacognitive instruction. That's very important to have all of this given to you by your family, by your teacher, by everything that you are exposed to. And deaf students need help learning how to learn. They require all of that support in learning to think and process. And this needs to grow within education, both in school and in society. And then the last point says centralizes contributions by and about deaf people. One example uh, in my previous studies is that we were focusing on units of discrimination uh, against the deaf in workplaces. And looking and analyzing uh, different things that happen, different lawsuits against those who are deaf. Uh, speaking about writing, uh, this was all very fascinating to me. In my studies, Deaf-centric curriculum is so valuable.
No. How does power relate to the deaf curriculum? Here's a few um, theories that helped me understand um, power. The first one I'll refer to, refer to as Foucault. This is a sign in for Foucault. Pretty sure you know the name. Knowledge is power. I know the phrase, knowledge is power. Power is knowledge. Power moves in manifold ways. This is an important uh, concept in, this, in the school education environment. What is power in school? Educators have an enormous amount of power, instructors, professors, teachers. They, they are born with it, like this is the design of it. Instructors know that there is power and the students also know that there is, is held power within them. Parents have power as well. In the United States right now, we have uh, an open, oh, we have open book bans where there's, they are actually burning books, which is a terrifying thing for me to consider. That is power and destruction. This power is very terrifying sometimes. Hemry and Fritch, they're more recent published. They focused on disabilities. Sorry, not deaf. Disabled people possess enormous, just enormous power because they are also expert designers and they know how to solve the problems that exist from uh, designers and situated problem solvers solvers. This happens a lot of the time in the disability community where support happens and sorry protests happen and, and support happens within bodies of people. In the United States, for example, there has been successful uh, legal uh, laws passed. As we all know, the American Disability Act, Americans with this ADA, came out of a number of uh, years of advocacy and protests from the disability community. They had to they claw and crawl up to get the meter, uh, the needle moved for a positive uh, outcome for people with disabilities. Disabled people had to crawl. There was visuals of people in wheelchairs, out of their wheelchairs, literally crawling up hills to describe this experience. Two more slides, or two more philosophers I'd like to talk to you about. Desi and Ryan, um, recently published, 2000. Their comment is that people express their own sovereignty, power, through agency and self-determination. The other one I would like to refer to is Cawthorn and Gabaroglic. I um, may have spelled that incorrectly. I actually did spell that incorrectly. Um, it's Gabaroglic. I'll have to fix that on my slides. Uh, they borrowed from Desi and Ryan and did some modifications on their research and on their publication for deaf people. Deaf people don't want Deaf people are self-determined. This is a benefit for deaf students and the educational process. It can be very applicable in their journey. This has had a lot of positive influences. In the United States right now, ASL is the third most popular language in studies in high school, which is saying something. English, of course, being first, Spanish being the second language, and ASL being the third. 
it has just exploded in our country. And it's because people think deaf people are cool. They're fascinated by the language. Deaf people want to learn American Sign Language. They want to learn about deaf people and see the deaf community. They want to be involved in the community. And I think that's a really good example of self-determination of deaf people that are proud of the language that they have and they can demonstrate to show the world that it is something that can improve and increase. But, <laughs> but there's always a but. Problems do occur when as well. Disabled people have historically and are continuing to be marginalized in schools and societies. Likewise, deaf people are minoritized in schools and societies. And that even though there is special education set up. I'll give you some statistics here, if I can show you now. In the next paragraph. Disabled people are the world's largest minority. They make up 20% of the world's population. 20%. Can you imagine the huge number? That is the number of people that exist in the world. Deaf people make up the majority of that. Excuse me, uh, the smallest minority. That is one-fifth. of dis that's disability. Now, if we focus on the deaf, they make up a smaller percentage, a very minuscule percentage. Of all the statistics that have been collected, all the data that's been collected over the last 40 years around deaf education in the United States, um, what has been found is this, that deaf students represent point, point 0.17%, that's 0 0.17%. Let me show you that up close, point 0.17. It is a fraction of a fraction in special education. Deaf represent only 0.17%. The results of all of this um, really create a, a hard struggle and tensions and dissensus. Well, another study, another published I'd like to talk to you about. Linda Kamasarov. Bilingual uh, deaf educators are rejecting the curriculum of the hearing. This leverages, you know, rather than ignores the cultural, the capital, the capital and linguistic resources that deaf students and deaf teachers bring to this classroom. Mm -hmm. The power results, deaf education has long been an example of, I'm sorry, the second part of this is that deaf education has over a very long time been an example of cultural hegemon. This is where deaf children are defined in education as aliens or as alien other. Curriculum, along with pedagogy, are mechanisms of power and control for deaf and the deaf life ways, which is contra to deaf application, uh, deaf curriculum. 
So now I've shown you a few things, um, what curriculum studies are. I've talked about deaf curriculum and what that is and the definitions of that. The third uh, topic I'd like to talk about was power and deaf curriculum. Those are the three areas that I've touched on now in this presentation. I'd like to switch it over to you. This is an opportunity for you to do some critical thinking, do some considering of how you uh, um, incorporate this information into your own practice. I'm going to submit another website link. It's a short uh, document. It's only three pages long, and I'll show it to you now. There will be handouts. Again, this handout is only three pages, and we're going to be having breakout sessions in this webinar, in this workshop, where our groups will be able to discuss um, the independence independently, how, excuse me, the, the interpreter just uh, corrected. We're going to be going into breakout groups where we will be discussing this material independently, and then we'll return to the larger group and report back. Here's the handout, I'm just, uh, what I'm referring to. And I've just uploaded it here. It's in the chat, should be a link. I'll just zoom in right now, if you'd like, so you can see a copy of it. The handout has three um, aspects, three pages. Page one is basically instructions um, um, of mine. I'm gonna close my PowerPoint screen now and then I'll open up uh, the handout. So if you, so you can see it more clearly, uh, you can also access it. Uh, uh, you can follow along. I'll open it now. Just a second. Yeah, Jeff just mentioned, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to do breakout sessions in this workshop. So I think what I'll do is a little bit more discussions rather than the individual. Maybe you can work as a group at another time. Uh, and if that's fine, we can work together in this Zoom environment and we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. So the page number two talks about EJ Santos. Page number one has instructions and page number three has instructions. But page number two, I'm going to show you now close up. It talks about the different curriculum. Uh, curriculum is not defined in one specific way so or, or thought about in any one way. So we'll talk about the differences in uh, perspectives and views of curriculum. And a lot of it is, there's a bit of history as well. Uh, of how curriculum is looked at through the through the uh, through the century, and grouped into different categories and different concepts and different ideas and theories and philosophies. Curriculum studies now is a is a is a field that is is huge and it can be explored in depth and and widely, and um, that's what we're going to be showing you now is the how curriculum can be. Uh, researched. I've picked a few, um, a number of uh, perspectives and views to, to, to apply here in this activity and the context as well. First, uh, you are going to read and analyze a variety of definitions of the curriculum. You'll summarize and interpret the implications of these definitions, compare and contrast them, identifying similarities and differences. You will apply knowledge to a new context and you're gonna write your own definition. 
oh, that's odd. <laughs> okay, I didn't do that. <laughs> that's kind of strange. Little glitch. I'll ask you to ignore that part. So your first step is to read and interpret. That's page two. There are nine different definitions that you should look at, and then you will carefully analyze these nine definitions. What you can do is if you have a sheet of paper, you can write them out, or you can just think about them without writing anything down. And if you want, you can add your thoughts into our chat box. You'll see each definition is summarized. I would like to see you summarize the main concepts using one or two words. Hmm. Formatting, it seems to be off on this page. <clears throat> Okay, I'm not really sure what happened to my PDF. Shit. <laughs> okay, so maybe what I'll do is I'll go back to my slides in my presentation. The slides are there and I'll be able to just enlarge them. It's the same basic idea. And then as I was saying, I would like you to summarize each of these nine definitions listed using one or two words. But let me go back to my presentation. And my uh, we're having technology issues, or I am right now. This is what the should look at. <laughs> let me zoom in. While you're reading these definitions, I'd like you to summarize them in a few key words, each of these definitions by each of these authors. So you read John Dewey's definition, and then you will figure things out. Truth is one of them you might wanna uh, identify. Experiences is another. So just choose one or two words in the definition to help you summarize each of these definitions. That would be an example for Dewey. Bodies of truth uh, is one of John Dewey's part of the definition. Next, if we move down to Bobbitt, if you read his definition, it speaks to an entire range of experiences. Unfolding might be one of the words that you choose to use. Next is Rugg's definition. Now, uh, developing or development might be one of the words you choose for this one. 
could be controlling. The next definition is from Caswell in Caswell and Campbell. Maybe the word that sticks out to you is guidance. The next one down is by Tyler. And then below Tyler is Gagne. For me, the word that pops up is capabilities. Next is from Popham and Baker. Again, the word that stands out for me here is consequences. That's a very pragmatic word. McBrien and Brandt is next. Writing plan, or excuse me, a written plan is something that is, stands out to me in this one.
And then the last one is from the Indiana Department of Education. For me, uh, the word that I see is evaluating and attainment. So I'm just going to zoom out now and I'll show you the other, other two. These are the last two authors and definitions. And for you, which words stand out? What are the important terms in here? In Skyers, mine, it might be situated. It could be dialectics as very Vygotskyan. I'll wait a second before I proceed, sorry. <laughs> I'll take a bit of a slower pace. <clears throat> And then next, looking at Lad's definition, marginalized. Or the concept of reconstruction. It's almost like a battle, uh, like a war. It's very interesting. So now you should have all of these words that have stood out for you in each of these definitions, the 11, whether you have nine or the full 11. Those are the critical words and terms that have stood out for you. Now, what I'd like you to do is see which resonate for you. Which ones are extremely valuable for you. And it could be something that you agree with, but some of these may be some things that you disagree with, that maybe you're struggling with. I'd like you for you to keep those in mind. And then, I'd like you to write a short, it could be sentence or paragraph outlining how these two definitions are similar to each other or different from each other. If you'd like, you can write this in your chat uh, and we can look at them and see if we can discuss them. If you'd rather keep them to yourself, of course, you can do that as well. Go ahead, I'll give you a few minutes to really ruminate on these ideas and concepts, put them together, and uh, just to really process what we've been talking so far, uh, talking about so far. Maybe look back and consider some of the things in my presentation, as well as how that can integrate with uh, your existing knowledge. Reflect.
Pahlavi uses a lot of uh, around truth. Others use a range or, or scales. Samuel uses um, a methodology or a, a gauge, uh, step by step. Pavan uses a, a outcome based. The other uses another. Indiana Department of Education uses interactive, which has been pretty cool. Holly mentioned uh, that deaf centric. That's a great. That's a great uh, Holly. Deaf centric. If you want to put your hand up, if you're brave enough, and you. Uh, want to be spotlit and use first language ASL, by all means, I support that. Uh, Jeff said that it is a possibility to spotlight you if you have something to share in ASL. Please do. Or if there's other ways, if you prefer to think about it, write it down in English, that's fine as well. We are all participants. We all participate in this type of event differently, and that's okay. There's five more uh, minutes, I think we'll focus on this and then we'll come back and uh, we can share as a group if you'd like. I'll give you five minutes. I know this is a little bit changed from what was written down in my plan, but the idea and the goal here is still to think about it and consider and ruminate. Um, pick a couple of curriculum designs, pedagogy, how it relates to pedagogy, relates to your learning possibly uh, from, your, from your past and your experiences in education. Might also how it relates to um, instructing as an assistant or as a primary instructor, maybe even tutoring how you can support the community as in, with interpreters, educational interpreters as well, could play a role in this. There's a lot of different uh, ways that this information can be applied. Curriculum in your context, it's not an abstract idea. I mean, it is, but it's meant to be applied in a specific environment in a, in a very um, concrete way. Halabi made a comment again that at, with RUG, their concept is that life connections and how curriculum can be made for the hearing world or for hearing education does not um, co uh, does not work with deaf education, deaf curriculum, and that critical analysis is pretty. Um, Pretty critical. Oh, I see. In the chat, uh, Pallavi made that comment. So the interpreter struggle. Uh, Rugg's comment of likeness stood out for me. It also explains why the curriculum made for hearing aids. Hearing kids does not resonate with deaf kids. Thank you. Uh, let's give two more minutes of writing down what your thoughts are, what, you're, what, uh, what you've been thinking about.
Mm -hmm. Teresa adds a very interesting point in the chat. Vygotsky has three main concepts. Cognitive development, an early intervention plan, cultural learning, the roots of culture or the root of culture, and learn and develop within the role in the community within the curriculum. That's great. That is a great question, Teresa. Thank you. That's this, this book is fantastic. This is Vygotsky's book. Uh, it's about deaf pedagogy in education. Uh, uh, so many people have it on their lists. Uh, it's a, it's a, got some great ideas and concepts in it. Culture, for example, social relation to deaf education. Oh, it is, it is a foundational, it is a fundamental concept. Language, where language comes from, how, how culture is connected without language is, is, is it's, it's, everything's connected intrinsically. Many, many psychologists and assessors and perspectives look at cognitive processes in a very clean way, uh, looking at it in a, in a physical perspective or as with just just plain cognitive with which isn't really all that there is there is the, there's the outcomes of interactions with society Vygotsky's point is is that there are so many connections with curriculum and how it impacts um, Vygotsky also in his time 1920s uh, he was from Russia. They focused on uh, Soviet. This was in the Soviet era. So there was a lot of different uh, groups um, under the communist rule. And there was a lot of support for this approach, this kind of work around deaf education. Vygotsky's message was that the curriculum uh, has really two main points. The first one being to develop civics within the students, deaf students. How does that work? So that they can be integrated in society, so that they can be good communist children. What does that look like? How does that, how is that achieved? The second one is work. Again, we need to focus on uh, that it was the Soviet communist era time and that uh, the values valueized, uh, they valued work in their society. So that development in their society uh, really focused on work and, and, and contributing in a, in a work capacity to, to, the, uh, to society. And that was, that was their, their time in the Soviet era. There's so many different amazing concepts and ideas brought forward in this book. I would suggest that you uh, look at it. A Gwendolyn um, made a comment. I'm just going to repeat it. Okay. Uh, okay, example. For my volunteer in my time with hearing children with different disabilities, does not get the chance of opportunities. Now there is a parallel between deaf children and mainstream or deaf school and not having the chance for getting example, or getting the opportunities, few opportunities. I, I, and you know what, you said you're nervous about the, making this comment, please don't be, it was an amazing comment. Thank you very much for being, for your bravery and really coming out there and expressing your ideas. This is what it's about. This is what per, another participant said. Let me go back up to it. What did you say? Let me put the right person here. Hav Kaval borrowed from Rug said that deaf education curriculum is not related 
to life, to, to living. Yeah. I mean, deaf have experiences through, they exist, they figure out how to exist through the world and society, but the, the curriculum doesn't exist for them. In the United States, I can think um, maybe two or three years ago, uh, it was during uh, Trump administration. Uh, one state actually made it, I think it might have been Texas, made a decision to uh, fire the um, Oh, to remove Helen Keller from the curriculum, to remove the whole idea of Helen Keller from the curriculum. And there was a no exposure for deaf. There was this a famous deaf person that is no longer part of the curriculum and has no longer a place in the history. So that kind of impact on an entire state is, is pretty important. It's pretty critical. I mean, there's an enormous body of information out there that is now missing a huge part for that state. I think there's a lot of um, English research around literature, specifically more specific to uh, cultural and cultural diversity in literature, which is amazing. Uh, this relates to black, brown, indigenous uh, representation, many different cultures. I mean, this is great. This is awesome to see this kind of increase in research. Uh, and Spanish specifically, the Latino, Latinx, the, the, the multiple countries, those who have escaped war or have fled from uh, their home countries to come here. These experiences being included in the curriculum is fantastic. But where's that equal representation for disability? Where's that, where's that representation within the curriculum for deaf people? As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are lagging so much in this area of research and, and curriculum inclusion. Again, I'll show you again uh, one aspect of my presentation. If I could go back. This fourth one, this fourth point, centralizes the contributions about deaf people, by and about deaf people. Let me say that again, by and about deaf people. This, this, this curriculum written by and about deaf people. Stories written by and about deaf people. I mean, this is now starting to become more pervasive, but th we are, uh, there's a lot more published uh, dark documentation from memorials. Um, I mean, that, that's a great statement. D by and about deaf people. literature and ASL and poetry, all of this. This is great, thank you. Uh, one last uh, question, and then I want to give you the floor to the participants. What benefits are there to a deaf-centric curriculum? I'd like for you to think about that. Again, if you feel brave, if you want to ask to be on video to share your ideas, we'll support you in that, please do. I see that we still have 38 people here. Feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to be on video. And you can think about it as well. And if you'd like, after this webinar is finished, if you wanted to contribute, you can as well. Okay, I'm going to continue. It will be my last slide and then we'll open it up for Q&A.
into the future of deaf curriculum studies. This is a proposed methodology. D. P. D. Perry, Cubic, and Lad have all published these ideas of an essential choice, making people have to choose between a bottom up construction and top down adaptation. It describes the confrontation of these. Do you start from the top and work your way down adapting curriculum to the deaf learners? Throughout my research, I think there was both that I considered. There are pros and cons to both approaches. And I think there's a third way. So a third way from the bottom up and the top down. It's a recursive approach and it becomes an inside out approach. You have the deaf community. Again, so this is a recommendation. Uh, it hasn't actually happened, but it is an idea here. Methodol methodological and a theoretical model for these four areas. And then once you get to the fourth one, you come back again in a cycle. Always cycling, always making improvements over time. So the first one is starting with perception. <coughs> You're identifying and leveraging the assets in deaf learners. There are so many benefits and so much deaf gain by deaf individuals. And it starts at the perception level using that critical analysis, both with disabilities and abilities that have that tension. Once you have that perception, then you go on to conception. I don't know if you're familiar with this term praxis. It is also cyclical. It involves theory, action, ref and reflection. So theory, action, and reflection but you have to start with the theory and you look at the basic ideas and then you go into taking action and you use a strength-based theory to bring this theoretical research together into a corpora. You're learning your teaching, their psychology, your social experiences. There's ethics and uh, the interpreter missed the one word. So the concept, sorry, the interpreter has a question. politics.
And this is one text, The Politics of Deafness. The Politics of Visual Language. These are just a couple of examples. And then from conception, you move to inception, number three. That is an interactive pilot studies. And this is uh, how you would sign that, pilot studies. Deaf education has not been evidence-based. And so we have to research. Those of us who research the curriculum has to be done with evidence of efficacy and enjoyment. Look at the curriculum, see, is it working? Is it effective? That's what I mean by its efficacy. Yes, or is it not? effective. And then you have to look as well as at enjoyment. Sometimes in education, in schooling, enjoyment is not discussed. Aesthetics and problems of education. We need that. We need to have joy. You need to have that beauty. And we have to find that within the curriculum. The fourth of this cycle is reception. And what that means is you have to have an openness. You have to have an openness to change and adapt. You have to find where you can adapt and make things fit. You might have a beautiful idea, a great idea, but in practice, it may not be efficient. You try it out and it doesn't work. A good example is Rochester, the Rochester method. That was an idea of fingerspelling everything. It, now, its idea may have been okay, but it, fingerspelling every single word and having to watch that uh, did not work. It was not successful. So that method was quickly given up. And then that's all of those is considered one cycle. And then you go again to the second cycle and you continue and you continue. You build on it more and more and things get better. Things improve over time. This is my last slide. So if, with the, you need to have effective change. You need ra radical optimism. That inspiration to keep going, to look for that equality. With students and deaf people from all over the world. where you see those who are experiencing pain and oppression, you find the beauty, you find people who are survivors. And you need to keep going. You need to continue. Secondly is the deaf centricity. That's everything we do in deaf education must be focused on deaf people. Doesn't matter, there's race, there's disability, there's language, all of these things, but they have to be 
deaf centric. At the center of all of this has to be deaf students and deaf people. And that leads to deaf futurity. Historically, deaf education has had many criticisms, have had many atrocities, has not been effective. There's a history of language deprivation, oppression, many traumas. But let's look to the future. That what a beautiful world it is to have deaf people to be in. And thank you. And this is in solidarity with deaf and disabled people worldwide. Okay, I think we have a few minutes left. If you have any questions. Wow, thank you, Dr. Michael Skyer. Thank you for your presentation. The, the conversation is critical. It's so important to have these conversations around curriculum, about fitting the learners that we serve, matching, being flexible, rather than following a strict regimented uh, curriculum. We need to figure out how to adjust our plans. Um, uh, Gary did have a question um, in the chat. Do you mind if we just, I'm just gonna go back and read it. Um, deaf education, deaf studies, deaf studies curriculum and the experiences thereof. With ASL education from the K to 12 environment in the curriculum, it's part of, part of language. L1, L2, lang first language, second language. Again, I'm just reading his English from Gary's chat. What benefits and applications to deaf using sign language in the curriculum have in literacy as for a sign language learner. Gary, well, thank you very much for that amazing, uh, that question is extremely clear. I knew exactly what you're talking about. Thank you um, for that, for, uh, for the interpreter as well. Uh, it is a metaphor, metaphors. So all children, whether they be deaf or hearing uh, or anywhere on the spectrum, disability, not disabled, have issues, have like an engine. It's called like an engine, we'll call it. They are born, they have an engine. The engine's perfect. It's a beautiful engine. Every aspect of that engine is working perfectly, beautifully. Then some like a V8, think about a V8 engine running so smoothly, it's humming along, right? So you have this beautiful engine and then there's an electrical system and then it becomes digital. And some have hand cranks. I mean, there's a lot of different aspects to this beautiful engine. However, everything, all of these need fuel. What kind of fuel? whether it's a liquid fuel, uh, mechanical fuel by turning that crank physically, whatever it is, there needs to be a fuel to continue that engine running. Language is a fuel, is that fuel. If there, are, if there is no fuel for that engine to run, then it stops running. It can't continue, it can't, it can't continue to run. So that, like deaf children, 
who have suffered from uh, language deprivation don't have the fuel. But the biggest, the biggest one here, I want to just reference again. Hmm. Gauti is a deaf person who I think is a deaf psychiatrist uh, uh, on, a, on a global level, world education around deaf, deaf education, uh, studied deaf people's uh, language deprivation and how the damage can be done to uh, a child's brain. The results showed that a lot uh, smaller gray matter development in the brain, physically smaller gray matter, because there's no fuel. This is, this is the lack of fuel to the engine that I referred to. This is my metaphor. If you pour diesel into an electric car, what happens? It doesn't work. So I, I see that as a metaphorical comparison for children who are uh, language deprived. So all of these types of engines, all of these types of experiences really depend on the, the, the right fuel for the engine. If the engine can't continue, then like if language doesn't exist or uh, culture doesn't exist, diversity doesn't exist, it won't run. Early exposure is critical to sign language. We all know this. It's essential. It is not optional. We really need to pick a sign. There are so many people waffling between what is appropriate. Well, they're doing this and this is sign language is okay, but it's not really, no. Straight up, this you absolutely need to expose at a very early age sign language. Equality, equality. Yeah. I won't even equivocate. This is essential. Thank you, Gary, for your comment. Question. Wow, thank you, Michael, for that's uh, that's amazing comment. That gives us a lot to think about, to think about our learners' perspective, the struggles that they have being le having learning deprivation, the language that they have, and their processes of learning. There, if there is, you know, the struggle through oppression, what they're missing out on. I mean, that's an amazing comparison with that engine. That really struck struck a chord with me. That discussion will definitely lead to um, the October 7th session where uh, presentation, Dr. Uh, Skyer will be returning again to continue his presentation. What we'll be talking about then is the understanding of the curriculum and then the methodologies and approaches to providing that teaching how these ideas and concepts can be applied in the classroom. We'll be talking about that in the October 7th session. But uh, just so you know, we will be emailing the, um, the resources, the book resources here that Michael uh, was, uh, Dr. Skyer was showing us on screen. I will have a list of resources sent out to everybody. And there's some videos as well. This uh, presentation will be edited so that um, if there's some glitches and things will be cleaned up, or if you wanted to review it, that link to this video uh, will be sent out in the future. DLI will send that out. The second presentation for Dr. Skyer is going to be on October 7th, and I keep an eye open for that invitation. And please, please, please sign up. No, keep all eyes open. Keep all your eyes open. <laughs> That's right. Again, Many, many thank yous, Dr. Skyer, for coming today and presenting. This is an inspirational speak, uh, speech for all of us. Thank you to the interpreters as well for being here. Yes, thank you again for Carolyn and Mike. This is Michael speaking. Thank you again for being here. Thank you all for coming to this presentation, and I really look forward to seeing you again on the 7th of October, 2022. Same time, 1 o'clock p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.